Chapter 27, Passing the Hours. One day, another Fiona came to my room. Her name was Fiona Alexander, and she said she was the head of communications for the hospital. I thought this was funny. I couldn't imagine the hospital in SWAT having a communications office. She said the hospital would like to take a picture of me. I thought this was really funny. Why would anyone want to take a photo of me looking the way I did? Would it be okay to take my picture? Fiona asked again. I didn't see the point of a picture of me with my swollen face in a hospital bed, but everyone here was so nice and I wanted to be nice in return. And I thought maybe my parents would see a picture of me and this would give them hope and bring them to me faster. I agreed, but I made two demands. I asked for a shawl so I could cover my hair and I asked her to please take the picture from my right side. The left side of my face would still not cooperate. The worst thing about being in the hospital was the boredom. While I waited for my family, I stared at the clock in my room. The movement of the hands around the dial reassured me that I was, indeed, alive and helped me measure off the minutes until my family arrived. The clock had always been my enemy at home, stealing my sleep in the morning when all I wanted to do was hide under the blanket. I couldn't wait to tell my family that I had finally made friends with the clock and for the first time in my life, I was waking up early. Every morning, I waited eagerly for 7 a.m. when friends like Ima, who worked at the hospital, and nurses from the children's hospital would come and help me pass the hours. When I could see well enough, they brought me a DVD player and a stack of DVDs. During my first days, they had turned on the TV for me. I watched the BBC for a few minutes and they were talking about the American elections between President Barack Obama and that other man, and then they changed the channel to MasterChef, which I had watched back in Pakistan. But my vision was still so blurry then that I asked them to turn it off and didn't watch TV again. But now my eyesight was better, although I was still seeing double a bit. I got to choose from Bend It Like Beckham, High School Musical, Hannah Montana, and Shrek. I chose Shrek. I loved it so much I watched the sequel right after. One of the nurses figured out that if she covered my damaged eye with a cotton patch, my double vision wasn't so bad. Meanwhile, my left ear kept bleeding and my head kept throbbing. But I passed the day with a green ogre and a talking donkey while I waited for my parents to come to England. On the fifth day, the tube in my throat was removed and I got my voice back. It was around this time that I put my hands on my tummy and felt something odd. There was a hard lump just under the skin. What is this? I asked one of the nurses. It's the top of your skull, she said. I was sure I'd misunderstood. Between my bad hearing and my trouble with words, I thought she'd said the top of my skull was in my tummy. Dr. Fiona arrived to explain. When the bullet hit my temple, it fractured the bone, sending splinters of bone into the lining of my brain. The shock caused my brain to swell. So the doctors in Pakistan removed a piece of my skull to allow the brain to expand. To keep the bone safe, they placed it under the skin of my abdomen. I had lots of questions for Dr. Fiona. It was like being back in biology class at school. I wanted to know exactly how they removed my skull. With a saw, Dr. Fiona replied. What happened after that? I asked. Dr. Fiona explained that the surgery had been a success but that I had developed an infection and that my condition had started to worsen. My kidneys and lungs began to fail and soon I was near death. So the doctors put me in a coma. That way I could fly to England for better care. 
You flew in a private jet, she said. A private jet? How do you know? I asked. Because I was on the flight with you, she said. I later learned that the United Arab Emirates had offered the plane, which was fully equipped with an onboard medical unit. Dr. Fiona explained that she and Dr. Javid had been in Pakistan advising army doctors on how to do on how to set up a liver transplant system. Dr. Javid was contacted for his advice, and he brought Dr. Fiona with him since she was a specialist in children's emergency care. She admitted that she had been a little nervous about flying into Peshawar because it had become dangerous for foreigners. But when she found out I was a campaigner for girls' rights, she came. She and Dr. Javid told the doctors in Pakistan that I wouldn't survive unless I was moved to a better equipped hospital, so my parents agreed to let me go with them. Dr. Fiona and Dr. Javid had been by my side for nearly two weeks. No wonder they behaved as if they'd known me forever. Dr. Fiona had to go take care of her other patients, children who were sicker than I was, but I had one last question. I was in a coma, I said, for how long? A week. I had missed a week of my life. And in that time, I'd been shot, I had an operation, had nearly died, and had been flown to the other side of the world. The first time I had ever flown out of Pakistan was on a private jet to save my life. The world had gone on all around me, and I knew nothing about it. I wondered what else I had missed out on.